Hi, I'm Mark Lynch, Director of the Project on Middle East Political Science and the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University. I'd like to welcome you back to our series of POMAPS conversations, leading uh, scholars in Middle Eastern studies, and to the Elliott School's International Affairs inbox. With me today is the Elliott School's own Nathan Brown, uh, who has the uh, the honor of being our first repeat guest on the POMAPS Conversations. Um, he's a professor of political science at George Washington University. Uh, Nathan, welcome back. Thanks for having me. So I thought we might start with something, with a simple question. Um, is the Egyptian revolution over? Yes, it's over. But <laughs> the yes part is the easy part. We, basically, we see the parts of the uh, you know, Mubarak era security state kind of reassembling themselves. Military is clearly a very dominant power right now. Security services have come back in force. The same kind of restrictions on, on, on speech and so forth and so on. Um, and we have really, I think, the prospect of a return to nominal democracy, but one in which the fundamental contours of policy are decided outside of the democratic process. So that, that's the yes part. The but part, I think, is a little bit interesting. Under Mubarak, you had a um, regime that was controlled centrally by the presidency. It's not clear that the presidency is going to be able to play that kind of role. It may be a little bit more of a coordinated leadership among several different institutions. And the second difference is that the society is different. The fact is that regardless of what we see right now, which is a society that is you know, b badly split, some are enthusiastically backing. Um, what has happened the, over, over the last month and a half or so, and some people are, are you know, very deeply opposed. After a while, I think the enthusiasm of this moment will wear off and we'll go back to a situation in which I think Egyptians in all kinds of different ways, in all kinds of different institutions, have become much more used to articulating their demands forcefully, demonstrations, strikes, protests, and that sort of thing. So we're going to see a livelier kind of politics, not necessarily full revolutionary politics, but already we're, going to, we're, we're beginning to see just a month and a half after the military ousted Morsi, some kind of signs that some, some of the groups that participated in this uh, overthrow of Morsi are having are, are beginning to put forward their own individual agendas. The, the, the mood in Egypt right now seems to be very nationalist uh, and actually very supportive of the military takeover. Um, how long do you think that can last? Uh, and is it possible for these groups that you describe to effectively press their demands, whether they're labor demands, political demands, um, human rights demands? Do they have any way of asserting themselves in the political system as it's developing? Um, it's hard to say how long it's going to last. I was actually last you know, physically in the country in June. I left a couple days before the June 30th demonstrations, but it was already clear then what kind of atmosphere there was. And this wasn't one that really uh, was, I would say, friendly to any kind of pluralism um, of, 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 of any sort. And the, the, the sort of hyper-nationalism was already beginning to emerge. Um, what we saw from the Morrissey presidency was that you know a new leader has about one year, a honeymoon of one year. It is clear, uh, I think, to most observers that the new leadership has absolutely no answers to Egypt's economic problems that the old regime, that Morsi didn't have or that Mubarak didn't have, and so on. So my guess is what we're going to see is, is some kind of slow kind of um, uh, 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 diminishing of the kind of the glow around the actions of uh, June 30th and July 3rd when the demonstrators turned out and when the, the military ousted Morsi. Um, but this may be a very, very slow process. The question is, as, 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 as you asked, in this new environment, how free are groups going to be to operate? And there it's not just a matter of them having grievances. We're clearly dealing with an environment in which the state is going to be far more uh, 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 I would even use the word repressive of, of dissent. We've seen that already. Morsi, I think, was rightly uh, criticized for some autocratic acts and some authoritarian acts. But the simple fact is that the media under Morsi were far more free and far more vociferous than they are right now in terms of uh, demonstrations. Yes, there were some attempts to harass demonstrators, even some attacks on demonstrators, nothing like what we've seen now. So the, so the real question is kind of what rules will the uh, current regime try to impose on public expression, public organization, and so on, especially um, what rules are they going to impose, not on the Muslim Brotherhood, that's clear, 
but on members of the coalition that has actually supported them up till now. And we don't know that yet. Well, you've been studying the uh, proposed draft of the Constitution uh, fairly closely. What signals are you getting from, these, from the new provisions of the Constitution? Well, you, what you see there, what they basically did was they took the 2012 Constitution, and, but they went through virtually every single clause. And in the current draft right now, it's very clear who was dominant in this process, right? because the military gets its favorite provisions included. The security apparatus, there's no real way for a Constitution with this language to have uh, uh, meaningful um, oversight over the security services. The judiciary gets very, very strong guarantees, and unsurprisingly, this was a judicial committee that drafted it. Um, but but who, uh, who loses out? Well, one group that loses out so far are the Islamists and the Salafis, who essentially backed the, uh, the overthrow of Morsi, convinced that they could rescue what they saw as a fundamental identity of the state being an increase in, 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 the, in the Constitution's uh, commitment to Islamic values and, and, and ways in which uh, Islamic law would be procedurally written into the uh, Constitution. Those things have, have, have dropped out. And then there are a whole host of groups out there that are already beginning to complain, saying, we didn't get our provision in there. We didn't get it, whether it's, it's, it's um, members of the State Auditing Bureau, or whether it's uh, labor unions, or, or advocates of, of children's rights, and so on. And you've already beginning to hear some criticism. Whether they'll be able to make their voices heard as the Constitution drafting process continues, it's something we don't know yet. In, in the Constitution as it's developing, uh, do you see any, any clear protections or provisions for pluralism, uh, rights of assembly, the basic Bill of Rights freedoms, or are those simply being submerged in essentially the old constitutional text? I think the 2012 Constitution was not as bad as its critics uh, claimed on those sorts of things, and this largely uh, 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 replicates that language. So they haven't made enormous changes in those areas. Um, so I would see it as operating pretty much as the 2012 Constitution is, in which case what you really have to go into is not simply constitutional text, but things like public atmosphere, to what extent, for instance, the security services are going to really be able to uh, call to account to follow these procedures, what kind of institutional guarantees are there. And there I would say um, the 2013 Constitution, as it's emerging, doesn't do much of a better job than the 2012 Constitution, probably a slightly worse one more because it's operating in a less pluralistic climate. Now, the, the crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood uh, especially, uh, were you surprised by the intensity and the scope of the crackdown as we've seen thus far? And do you see any, how do you see the future role of the Brotherhood in this emerging Egyptian society? Have we gone the full Nasser? Um, the, in, what I think most people expected was that the Brotherhood would go down fighting. And they also expected the security services, if they were called out, uh, to be extremely rough. The surprise was that it took them a, both sides a while. The Brotherhood didn't really resist uh, the coup itself. They really began to uh, pull out their supporters and, and launch their sit-ins, uh, and they really picked up steam in the weeks afterwards. Um, so that was a little bit of a surprise, that there was, that there was violence um, was not a surprise, that it took so long, that it really took um, um, you know, a month and a half after the coup, I think was a surprise. In terms of the uh, actions of the security services and how violent um, uh, this was, um, Nobody was under any illusion that if the security service were, were called out to crush the demonstrations, there would be a lot of casualties. Maybe people did not necessarily expect them to go into four digits, uh, but people thought that there would be an awful lot of casualties. Um, but the but the new regime kept on giving off kind of conflicting signals. Yes, we're going. We, we, yes, we're going to uh, remove these demonstrators, but of course we're going to do so in a peaceful way, in a gradual way, and 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 so on. So it wasn't a necessarily a tremendous surprise, but there was some uh, there were some indications that the regime was having some hesitation. Where it goes forward from here, I think. I mean, it's clear that both the Brotherhood and the new regime have made their choices. And for the Brotherhood, it's that, you know, Morrissey is the legitimate president. Yes, they send off some kind of signals that they're willing to compromise on that, but they're not going to cooperate with the new uh, regime and the new rules of the game. They've essentially decided to go into opposition and to accept the full price that that imposes on them. 
And the regime has made its choice that it is out to crush the Brotherhood. It may not necessarily direct this towards all Islamists. It could be that if the Brotherhood suddenly changed its mind, which I think is unlikely, they might uh, uh, lessen up a little bit on the repression. I'm not going to say this goes back to the uh, Nasser period. Um, it, because that was sustained, it went on for uh, you know really a decade, you could say, a decade and a half. Um, but I do think that w the level of oppression that's directed against the Brotherhood is now the most severe that it's been really in a generation. You know, in the years leading up to the revolution, of course, there was there was a long process of societal change, cultural change, um, the Islamization of Egypt, including state institutions, the judiciary. Uh, the, the public culture and the like. And uh, there seems to be a backlash not only against uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, but against this role for Islam in public life. How do you see that playing out? Uh, does that get rolled back or does Egypt go back to what it was under Mubarak with this actually very prominent role for Islam in, in state institutions and in public life? I'm not sure about that, and, and I think what we're dealing with are very short-term political actions, but you're asking about a long-term um, social trend. And, and it's very, very hard to project out from the current moment. What is clear is that Egypt is still nothing like a secular state. And in some ways, some of the religious institutions of the Egyptian state, such as Al-Azhar, are playing an even more prominent role right now. And as some people have you know, noticed, General Assisi, the new dominant military leader, um, is somebody who has a reputation for being personally devout. So an elimination of Islam from Egyptian public life I don't think is necessarily in the cards. That said, the political forces in the society that now seem to be dominant, a lot of them are ones that if they're not secular, are not necessarily paying the same kind of lip service um, to Islam that used to be so routine in the past. So we're, we might, what we might see is kind of a return, perhaps, um, you know, at most to the Nasser period, which people maybe remember in retrospect as secular, but wasn't really secular. There was still a significant uh, 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 state role in sponsoring religion, in, in mandating religious instruction in public schools and so on. But overall, the flavor of, 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 of uh, public discourse just wasn't nearly as centered on, is, on Islam and on religion as it is today. So we might be going back uh, to that period, or we might be going back to something like the Mubarak and Sadat period in which um, religion still plays a, a, a prominent role, a very prominent role, but it's much more state controlled than it is, than it was, say, on, for the last couple of years or so. I guess the last question then is, is there anything that the United States can usefully do to, uh, to help Egypt through this? Um, short term, no. The decisions have been made, and um, they may be bad decisions for Egypt, they may be good decisions for Egypt, but in essence, right now, most political actors um, complain very, very loudly about the United States, about the Europeans, about international media, but they're really domestically focused right now. What the United States does doesn't necessarily factor into those calculations uh, very well. I do think that you have this odd disconnect between what I would say is public atmosphere in Egypt and international public opinion, if by international we mean United States and Europeans, and to some extent I would say uh, uh, a little bit uh, more broadly than that. What happened in Egypt, it, in the eyes of most Egyptians, and certainly most politically articulate Egyptians, was a mass uprising against a group that was trying to impose its violent and intolerant agenda on the rest of the society. What happened in the rest, in, in the eyes certainly of the United States and most Europeans, was a military coup that may have had popular support, but also one that produced a re regime that is quickly accumulating a fairly horrific human rights record. There's an absolute disconnect there. And my sense is that sooner or later that disconnect, right now Egyptians complain about it, but sooner or later it will begin to work its effect, especially on the Egyptian political elite. Um, and, and so what makes more uh, sense to me is not that the United States tries right now to get a very specific political outcome in Egypt, but that if a, a 
a group of international actors work multilaterally to communicate to the new Egyptian leadership, okay, we're not going to try and reverse what you did, but you're operating under a little bit of an international cloud right now, and you have to watch things like democratic practice and human rights record and so on. That will short-term have very little effect, but long-term may be able to unfreeze the situation inside Egypt just a little bit. All right, thanks, uh, Professor Nathan Brown, George Washington University, and uh, thanks for watching the Palm Maps Conversations and the Elliott School's International Affairs Inbox.